Say this word with me, Acharit. Once more, Acharit. In Hebrew and some of the related languages, there are words for direction, prepositions, adjectives, things like that, that often come from parts of the body. For example, the Hebrew word for head is rosh, and the word for first, or the word for beginning, comes from that word. Why? Because this is on top, this comes first. In English, we can talk about being at the head of the class, meaning the top of the class. In Hebrew, you can talk about being at the head of the mountain. That means the top of the mountain comes from head. In Hebrew, if someone is standing next to you, it's al yadeh, which is from the word for hand. It's by the hands of. You're standing right next to, it's literally by the hand. You get the image. Acharit comes from a word related to the word for back, behind, that which comes after. And this is the simple principle about Acharit. From your vantage point, you cannot see what comes after. You cannot see my back. I could get up to preach and I look just fine. But see, as far as I can tell, no one's grinning or looking at me funny. From the front, relatively speaking, I look fine. But maybe I just sat down on something and there was some chalk or there was some tape. And when I turn around, my whole back, there's tape stuck on it or there's chalk or the thing with but you can't see that from this vantage point listen to me it is God's purpose always to show you the acharit the final end that which comes after and it is the devil's whole method and the method of this world to blind you to that it is God's purpose always to show you the acharit the final end that which comes after and it is the devil's whole method and the method of this world to blind you to that. This word acharit means that which comes after, the after effects, the final consequences, the end. So you'll read in the Bible about, in the end of days, ba'acharit hayamim, in the end of days, this will happen. This word, acharit, occurs 65 times in the Hebrew Bible, but 13 times it occurs in the book of Proverbs. In other words, one out of every five times this word occurs, it is found in the book of Proverbs. And there's a theme in Proverbs, you can jot the verse down, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20. Proverbs 19 20 it tells us to listen to counsel and receive instruction so that in our acharit written to you written to me in your acharit you will be wise that's the whole purpose of the book when the story's done when everything's written when the books are closed that in your acharit you will prove to be wise I don't know if you've ever watched a sports event and the team you're rooting for has a phenomenal first half of the game, a phenomenal first three quarters of a game, phenomenal first 95% of the game, and then in the last few minutes they blow the whole thing. And that's the only thing that matters. They got eliminated. They lost. There's a loss. And that's the only thing that shows. It didn't matter how well they played up to that. In the end, they blew it. Someone can be some great superstar in the kingdom and blow it in the end and be lost forever. What matters is your acharit. And I remember many years ago, 
having yielded to the flesh in some relatively minor area and then just felt miserable about it. I said to myself, if I could remember how I felt after I sinned this time, before I sinned the next time, I would never sin. If I could remember the, the consequences, if I could remember the, the shame, if I could remember the grief, if I could remember what came out of it, and if I held that in front of me, if I held the akharit in front of me, before the next time, there wouldn't be a next time. But it's the way of the flesh to appeal to the here and now. Oh, I've been dreaming of another world, one where you are standing here with me, and where I can see clearly how you're carrying me along. And I want to just keep it there, for your peace here, all of this. If you take me to another place, or oh, one where oh, I can't see. Speaking to the brothers here, she looks so appealing. She has just what you want. She's smiling at you from that magazine cover. She's calling you from that TV screen. She's talking to you through the internet on your computer. And she said, I'll satisfy you. She said, you come to me and your fantasies will be realized. Boy, you may be a married man and your wife may be a pretty gal, but boy, she doesn't look like that one. She's not so appealing and she's not so open and she's not so available. There's that call, there's that pull, and it seems so irresistible at that moment in flesh. But her acharit, the final consequences of associating with her, look at what it says. They are bitter as gall and sharp as a double-edged sword. About 13, 14 years ago, I was driving. I was taking the train, Long Island Railroad, into New York City where I was teaching some Korean students, training for ministry. And I picked up a newspaper on the subway, on the train, and I began to read it. And I read a story that, boy, just had my stomach in knots. That whole day and for days I was churning over it after I read it. There was a wealthy businessman on Long Island. He was being investigated by IRS by the tax people for some potential tax violation, but the guy had money. And some people found out that he had money and decided they were going to kidnap him and they were going to hold him for ransom and get his wife to pay them a large sum of money. So they set it up. They got one beautiful girl, one attractive young lady in this little gang they had. And she met this guy at a bar. And she said, listen, you meet me at such and such a house, such and such a time. Let's have a little fun. She was a beautiful woman, a lot younger than he was. No restriction, gets to do what he wants. Just enjoy the pleasure of the moment. Fulfill his fantasy. And he walked into that house, and when he walked in, she was waiting for him. But not just her. There was a gang of people. And they jumped on the guy, started to beat him bound him and gagged him and brought him to a rundown part of New York City to a vacant apartment building. And they tied this guy up and they began to abuse him. They called his wife and they demanded a ransom. And when she's working on trying to get the money, she said she's going to pay him. They began to torture this man. They began to burn him with cigarettes from head to toe. They began to beat him with their fists. They put a diaper on him and they made him relieve himself in a diaper. And then for five days they starved him. And as the wife was coming up with the money and ready to pay, these people were so out of control, they beat him to death. 
I remember reading that and thinking, if he could have only seen his acharit, if he could have only seen for one minute himself being tortured and abused, relieving himself in a diaper, being starved to death, being beaten, being burned, being raped by other men, if he could have seen it, if he could have heard the screams and the cries and seen the torture he was going through, if he could have touched it for one second, he never would have gone near that lady. If there were a thousand of the most beautiful women in the world offering him whatever he wanted, if that was the Akharit, he wouldn't have touched it. Oh, but the devil never shows you the Akharit. He shows you the bait. He doesn't show you the hook behind it. He shows you the pleasure of the moment. And at that moment, everything in you says, I must have it. The pleasure of the moment, like Esau, sold his birthright because he was hungry. That's the way of the world. Advertising is made just to pull you in like that. Fashion is made just to pull you in like that. Everything to blind your eyes to the final consequences. God says, remember the Acharit. Please hear me. This is something very personal to me. I got saved in 71. And from 1971 to 1987 in the New York, Long Island area, I was basically with four different churches or ministry organizations. So I had a total of four different men that were either my pastor or over me in a ministry situation or a senior co-worker along with me. One of the pastors has his one of his daughters in our school here. He is the only one out of the four that did not commit adultery. Three out of these four men committed adultery and destroyed their marriage. I'm talking about people who were anointed. I'm talking about one of them that prayed five hours a day. I'm talking about another one that was a leader to leaders. I'm talking about another one that was a man of faith and heard the voice of God. And every one of them destroyed their ministry. They worked for it for years. They prayed, they fasted, they sought God. And one hour of reproach, one hour of folly destroyed it all. People have put their hope in your walk with God. People are looking for someone that's not going to disappoint them. People are looking for someone that's true blue. People want to believe that, that that leader really cares for them as a soul and is not just into them as, as merchandise or just for their own opportunities. And maybe there are hundreds that you're influencing, maybe there are millions that you're influencing, and you're appointing them to Jesus and then you mess up. You've hurt all of them. You brought reproach to the name of Jesus. You made a mockery of the gospel. And all those people, they've been shattered.